Welcome, everyone. Um, today we're having uh, a seminar by Philip uh, Sponenberg, DVM PhD. He served as a technical advisor to the Livestock Conservancy since 1978. He provides counsel and mentoring to conservancy staff, breeders, and breed associations, scholars, and non governmental op organization partners. He was a moving force for establishing the conservation priority list and the standards for rare breed, in, breed inclusion in that list. Because of the quality and the originality of his approach to con conservation, Dr. Sponenberg's expertise is internationally renowned. He is an author of several books on color genetics, conservation, and is sought after as a speaker domestically and abroad. Uh, Phil is a professor of pathology and genetics at, the, at Virginia Tech in Blacksburg, Virginia. On his own farm, he's a conservation breeder of Tennessee fainting goats and uh, also enjoys playing color genetics with his brown chickens. So I will turn it over to Phil and take it away. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's been a rough week for breed conservation, but we're going to get through this. So... Um, I'm gonna, the more this is a discussion and a conversation is gonna be better than if it's just a lecture. So, um, and I'm trying to monitor chats um, as well. And my PowerPoint skills are rudimentary. So it usually has a mind of its own and races through this kind of stuff. Um, and then I have to back it up. So we'll see. But if you have a question or if you have a complaint and if, at this point, I would have to say, if we get to the entire hour and you haven't been insulted, I have not done my job. <laughs> but um, you know, take that with a grain of salt, um, and we will keep going. The basic background is horse breed, horses. Uh, for some strange reason, it's actually horses and goats. But most horse breeds and goat breeds are recent and blended, and so but Caspians are the exception to that rule. There's a few horse breeds internationally that are exceptions to that rule even though every horse breeder says that their breed came off the ark with Noah, that really tends not to be the case. So Caspians, what, what I'm trying to say here is Caspians are important. And so th th they're actually representatives of only a handful of breeds that can really claim to be all that distinctive from the rest of them. And that's not to say that we shouldn't be conserving other horse breeds, but it's to say that the Caspian has a unique position there. So. What that also means is that uh, your responsibilities as breeders are actually quite high and you need to make wise decisions. Okay, and so what that, okay, so basically their effective conservation is important and I'm having trouble making things work here. So this importance, um, as with all breeds, it springs from a combination of the foundation. In the case of the Caspian, that was a long time ago. Isolation since then, um, in the case of the Caspian, is actually pretty high. So you have an isolated gene pool. Other examples of this would actually be the Icelandic horse, because we know that once they brought horses, they quit bringing them to Iceland. And that's, you know, in the, in the case of the Caspian, it's much, much longer than the Icelandic, which would be another isolated breed. After that, Foundation isolation, you have to add in selection by the environment and selection by human owners. Both of those are important. Um, and they're going to be more important in some breeds than in others. I think it's, it's probably a moderate importance um, <clears throat> to the Caspian. We're not going to be able to duplicate the environment or the, the, either the cultural or the physical environment of the Turkoman steppes um, here in the United States. But you know, you, we do need to be sensitive to that you know, selection environment, you know, both for production, but also for adaptation and survival. Mm -hmm. um, each of these factors, are those four factors, so foundation, isolation, and the selection environment are going to contribute to understanding how best to effectively conserve this breed. So it's, it's mostly about the horse and its history, and it's actually less about associations and registries important those those are. And I realize that we all represent um, registries and associations, but we have to focus on the horse and on its history. So the goals are to include every purebred and to exclude every crossbred. 
and to manage the genetic structure. Now, that is so easy to say, and it is so difficult to do in practice. So because this including every purebred and excluding every crossbred actually pull against each other. And that's going to be, that's going to play out differently in different breeds, but those are all going to be important aspects. Um, so, and you know, if you all don't weigh in and ask questions, then this is going to be real, real short. Just thought I'd warn you. So is this easy? No. And it's not easy because of the political situation. And I can't see everybody, but those of you that I can see should be <laughs> nodding your head yes. Um, and then agendas. Agendas really can overtake this thing. And especially for horses, the demand is the key. Um, for most other species, we can always eat them. And especially in North America, you know, we can't do that with horses. Um, and that, that has really changed the game for horse breeding I, I'm across all breeds. We are facing challenges that 20, 30 years ago, we basically weren't, we weren't facing. It's gonna play itself out um, quite a bit differently in different breeds, but it does, it does provide a backdrop for this. So demand is everything. And we, we just had a discussion a couple of weeks ago. Um, it was actually focused more on a different breed, but you know, how important are the genetic factors related to reproduction in horses? because in the, in the absence of demand, that's it. You know, basically horse reproduction is not limiting conservation. It's the demand and the breeding, the breeding activity that are limiting it, not the ability of the horses to actually reproduce. That's gonna be a little bit different for different breeds, but overall, I think that's quite true. Okay, how many generations does it take for a half-bred horse to be bred back to pure stock? Um, <clears throat> That's an interesting question, <laughs> and, and it's a loaded question, and I appreciate it. The reason it's loaded is, you know, basically for some breeds, some breeds will allow grading up. Other breeds will never allow grading up. And um, that, that's more of a political and a biological question. So leaving the, leaving the politics aside, um, we, by the time you've bred back you know, if you, that, that first generation is only half bred, the second generation is three quarters, then you get to seven eighths. Up at, uh, so when you get to 31, 30 seconds and 63, 60 fourths, you're over 90% pure bred. Now, if the value of a breed is its predictability, at that point, you have achieved the predictability. So in general, I am not opposed to upgrading. Um, there are specific breeds that for historic reasons and perhaps for biological reasons, upgrading doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, and I, I am very much an outsider in the Caspian breed. Um, but due to its um, due to its uniqueness, I guess I would um, I would argue that um, this may actually be a breed for which upgrading does not offer a great deal. And part of that is that uh, this is an extreme breed. It's small and it's fine. And so across all horses, that is a very, very unique combination. So we're, we're gonna, um, but don't, don't lose sight of that. We're gonna come back to this issue and perhaps flush it out a little bit more when we talk about some other things because buried in this question are some other important issues. And that is, what is a purebred? And that, that question is extremely important. It's extremely important here, but it's also important in Iran. So the basics, so, you know, hold that thought and you know, hold my toes to the fire later. So breeds are important. And some of the basics are breeds actually predate registries. And this, uh, this aspect and this concept really trip up sincere and devoted people that are interested. And I, I know that some of you already have your hackles up. Um, and what does this mean in practice? And the problem is that many breeds are fragmented by splits. And if you're nodding your head, yes, please do. But um, this, this does not help and in most cases. Now, in some cases, there's legitimate and 
practical reasons for splits. But when these become really acrimonious, then we're shooting ourselves in the foot, basically. And I'm, I'm giving you this on a Saturday, and I have spent the week trying to avoid splits in two different breeds. And that made me think, and this is not just horses, this is across the board. And that made me think, well, gee, how many breeds am I involved in? <laughs> and that number is quite large. And how many breeds that, that I'm involved in don't have splits? And that number is quite small. Now, that, that could be that I'm mostly involved in, in breeds that are having problems and splits cause problems, you know, or it also could reflect the fact that, you know, basically um, splits fragment things and that's becoming the, in the, in the problem. A, a chat comment says, yes, in the UK, splitting the registry split the national herd and the people for 18 years, no one gained anything. Now, um, this, I'm an American, so I'm speaking American. I realize that we're supposed to all speak English. I'm speaking American. And interestingly, America was populated by a bunch of people that could not get along and had to leave where they were from because they couldn't get along there. And I don't know how much of that's genetic, but I'm a geneticist, okay? So, you know, we really, really enjoy not getting along. And so, and we, we have a governmental system in place that allows splits. Some countries do not allow splits in breed registries. Each breed registry gets one association and that's it. We are not like that here. So we are very, very prone to split, split, split until we get just exactly what we want. But that usually leaves us quite isolated and quite alone. So it, 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 um, Okay, so the, the, the note is, please read the questions aloud, and I, I have been trying to. Uh, the Caspian is a worldwide breed. How can the population be managed when we can't even keep Caspians in North America on the same page? We now have three registries and two DNA bases for Caspians in North America. Um, we can, yes, those are the problems. Hopefully we can flesh out some answers. I'm, I'm really, um, and I don't know exactly how to handle this um, in the North American situation, but in general, the, the, the background question is, is this horse a purebred or not? Not, and that, that's a different question then, is this two things overlap, we come out ahead. To the degree that those two things do not overlap in either direction, we do not come out ahead. So if we are, if there are purebreds out there that are not registered, that's a problem. That's a huge problem. Um, and you know, um, how, to, how to, you know, basically <laughs> thread that needle is extremely difficult. Um, so in most breeds, the registries do not include every purebred. And in some breeds, this is really, really important. In some breeds, it's really not all that important. You know, basically, if, you, if I were an Angus cow breeder in North America, and I had a purebred animal that was not registered, that would not affect the breed at all because it's a huge breed. You know, for, for these um, breeds that are perched on the um, edge of extinction, that becomes extremely important. Now, this is gonna actually flesh out a little bit differently, um, depending on where you are. So where, you know, basically, where is that horse? That becomes different. Now, the rules should be different than Iran than anywhere else. Now, I said USA, and now as I look at people coming in and some of the questions, we probably have an international group here, which is really, really good, because we can approach some of these things and try to flesh them out. Now, the Iranians are really likely to encounter new purebred horses occasionally. These are horses that have been overlooked. Now, this in a breed's homeland, this gets really, really complicated in a hurry. Um, these discovered horses may or may not have DNA signatures identical to what's been previously, previously documented in Iran, because in Iran, in contrast to everywhere else, you're likely to find occasionally little pockets of horses that have been overlooked and their isolation is going to provide for DNA profiles a little bit differently. Now we see this in different breeds, so I'm not just spouting this off as some theoretical issue, but this happens all the time. I mean, and this is one of the, this is one of the pitfalls of DNA validation for a local breed. And this breed is local in Iran and perhaps in, you know, 
other countries adjacent to the Caspian Sea, um, but we're not going to go there today. Now, so keep an open mind. You know, basically, you have to look at the horse, you have to look at the history, you have to make a wise decision. Now, the other key point here is, um, and I, I was fortunate enough, actually, decades ago, to have this conversation with Louise Farouz, and we you know, had a, real, you know, a really, really wonderful dialogue for a while addressing this specific issue. And she was you know, very much on board with this idea that, yes, if we encounter newly um, discovered horses, they need to be fully included. And what is really important is when those come in, they are equally important to the already registered and acknowledged purebred horses. Chat question, you know, how many generations does it take of upgrading to achieve purebred status? And these horses that are discovered, you know, in the homeland, it's an entirely different issue. And a whole lot of breeds really have a poor record of getting their head around this. You know, basically, a discovered horse is either purebred or it's not. If it is purebred, it comes in as a full purebred. Now, a whole lot of horse breeds will have, and cattle breeds and goat breeds and sheep breeds, you know, they may have a, um, they may have a protocol for rescuing these horses or recovering purebreds, basically, is what they say. But what they're going to do is they're going to say, oh, yes, you know, this animal looks purebred, seems to be purebred. The history points to the fact that it's purebred. We're going to enter into the registry. And those offspring, you know, are still stuck in a preliminary registry. And then after, you know, three, four or five generations of purebred sires, they can be entered into the purebred herd book. That defeats the purpose completely of trying to go out there and discover purebreds. Those horses must, if they are in fact legitimately purebred, you know, and there, there's a whole bunch of ways we can game this system, and I realize that, um, probably less in its homeland than here, you know, but um, and this is not going to be available here because you're not going to discover, you know, lapsed purebreds, you know, in some village somewhere because you just, you can't do that here. So I don't know if that helps or not. And if it doesn't help, somebody say something in chat and I'll try to make it help. Now, we're in the USA or in the UK or somewhere else, Germany. In the USA, there's going to be no external overlooked local source of purebreds. You know, I mean, you know, you're not going to find these in Blacksburg, Virginia. It's like, oh, look what we found. All purebreds in the USA are going to descend from imports. Now, however well or poorly documented those imports were, and this is going to vary breed to breed, somebody can educate me on Caspians, but my, my impression on Caspians is that you, you didn't have a whole bunch of imports that were not validated at the time of importation. You know, if we come back to, you know, small Sicilian donkeys, there's actually a whole bunch of imports that were made that were really, really poorly documented. So we actually might, you know, if we were interested in miniature Sicilian donkeys, we might actually be able to find some of those that, yeah, you know, we'd have to evaluate the history and the looks and everything else. I don't think that's the situation in Caspian horses, that we can insist that they descend from imports that are validated, documented. But um, even in, a, in the case of lapsed pedigrees, so a horse that you know, basically has a lapsed pedigree and purebred status is much more than a pedigree, this means that the DNA can actually be um, fairly useful. Something in the chat, yeah, that's right. We can find purebreds in villages, herds, important, especially for local breeds. Most of my work is actually with local breeds so that, you know, speaking as an American on this Caspian issue for the American audience is a little bit strange because this, this whole issue of where do we discover, you know, overlooked purebreds is extremely important in the local situation. And it's encouraging to see the Iranians um, addressing this because, frankly, in the United States, we address this extremely poorly for most of our local breeds. Now, in the case of DNA, and I, I'm a geneticist, I believe in DNA, DNA can lead us astray. But um, you know, in this situation, in the United States, we need to be really, really careful. And what that means is that you know, we have a horse. OK, so now you're presented with a horse. And let's say that there's two or three generations of lapsed pedigree. Now, I know I realize that those of you that love registries are going to be horrified. Um, most people are horrified at me at some point in my life anyway. So we'll just keep going. Now, any, in this situation for this breed, 
any novel variants would exclude a horse from inclusion because we have enough of a database, we have enough of a look back at those imported um, resources that anything else is going to be really, really suspect. So here we can say exclude it. Can't say that in the RAN. Purebreds here are going to have DNA consistent with past horses. And, and so in the United States, and everywhere else. Recovering purebreds is actually important, especially in a situation where uh, registries and breeders are fragmented. Um, and <laughs> yeah, and I realize I'm speaking to one registry and that's important. Um, if you wanna hear really, really bad things about me, I can give you a list of references, <laughs> some of whom are involved in Caspian horses. So I'm just saying, you know, that yes, all this is controversial. In the United States, recovery of purebreds is important. So, you know, from other registries, you know, sorry, but we're going to have to uh, uh, say that out loud, and from lapsed horses. In either case, in either case, the horse, I said, should have, let's say must have, decent historical trace back to purebreds, you know, rather than just, oh, this horse looks right, and DNA validation. And that's because in the situation in the United States, yes, this should be an avenue that's open, you know, but it is unlikely in the United States to bring in something that is otherwise completely unrepresented. Does that make sense? Um, and it, it really for recovery, the ideal situation is to, to bring in something that is otherwise unrepresented. And so Brian Larson and I you know, have periodically talk about Lincoln sheep and in the Lincoln sheep breed, um, there, there was an interesting uh, and important population you flock of Lincoln sheep that is and the breeding of those sheep was unique enough that their recovery was actually important to the breed. You know, there may be situations in the Caspian where that is actually an issue. It would be something I'm unaware of. For um for breeds that are imported, this is, you know, especially fairly recently imported in contrast to the Lincoln, that that situation is going to be a little bit different. But um, that's just something to chew on, maybe to have a discussion about. We're going way, way too fast because there's not enough chatting. So a lot of this is some of the political side. Um, now, we'll talk some about um, biology. Um, managing breed structure is never easy, and it's always important. Um, locating rare bloodlines is important, and uh, only you in the United States, I'm not deeply familiar with the pedigree and population structure of the Caspian in the United States, um, using these effectively is important. And especially um, when we go um, when we go back to understanding breed structure, this becomes important. Now I have another chat here. And Mary, you're gonna have to help me if I'm missing chats. Um, I'm, not, I'm not trying to. But um, in fact, the pure pop Caspian population outside of their native home of origin only goes back to about 10 to 15 individuals um, pre-foundation, which means out of the woods, but meeting the breed standard. Um, the rest were only first generation. Somebody may have to actually explain that more to me. Um, with respect to help with conservation of the Caspian at the level of the international population, one, what is the importance of recognition and assessment of remaining potentially Caspians in their native land that have not been identified and studied, and how should it be handled based on your experience working with other animals and breeds? Um, that's an important question. And um, we're gonna have to assume here that um, people are of goodwill and are sincere. Um, the best case scenario is that um, everybody in Iran is as interested that's involved in this, and this is not against Iranians, so do not take this this way. You know, this is, I mean, we can paint this in a lot of cases, you know, but basically one issue here is how reliable is the inclusion process in the home country? And in, I, I work, especially in Latin America, for some of those breeds, that process is very, very, very robust and very, very good. And in fact, in some situations, it is probably too restrictive. Um, speaking of the Chilean, the Chilean horse here, um, they have a really, really powerful, really, really great horse. There are probably overlooked sources of that horse that are important to that breed due to the fact that it's 
very, very popular, very, very numerous, but the breeding is individual excellent horses. So how important is the, um, are these potentially Caspian horses in their native land? Extremely important. That is under the assumption that um, the, the demand structure and the pricing structure is not such that you get a skewed market and then a, um, an, an incentive to put forward horses that barely classify as Caspians. Does that make any sense? That is a really, really complicated issue. Um, and in that situation, um, you, you just have to be careful of the demand structure and the pricing structure. If the pricing structure gets out of control, fraud starts becoming important. And that is true across all breeds. I am working now with Spanish goats in the United States. Spanish goats are really, really fortunate to have huge, huge herds of goats in Texas, long overlooked, only useful as what they were worth for meat. In the last two years, we have seen the prices go through the roof and a billy goat sold for $3,900. Once that happens, you know, if you want to buy a billy goat for $3,900, come, I got some. But once that happens, then the, the incentive for fraud becomes extremely, extremely powerful. And that's the way to lose, especially an adapted breed, an importantly adapted breed. Now, so please discuss the importance of assessment and selection and elimination of the internationally, re of the internationally recognized as purebred in North America that are distinguished just based on lineage. Um, okay, hold that thought. Um, that um, hold that thought. We're going to have to come back to that. That's um, the, the, well. Okay, hold, <laughs> we'll address it now. Th there's two issues here. One issue is is this horse purebred. The second issue is how good this how good a horse is this. Those are two different issues, and you have to figure out how to uh, how to thread that needle. In the United States, most of the breed associations, the question is, is this horse purebred or not? That's across breed associations, that's across breeds, okay? Now, in Europe, for example, that, that, that question is as much, how good a horse is this as, is this a purebred horse or not? You know, and especially in warm bloods where it's just like, how good is this horse? Forget if it's purebred or not, we just wanna use it if it's a good horse. Those are two completely different questions and you have to figure out which one of those questions you want asked. Um, and we fight this all the time because, well, Poitou donkeys, we're working with Poitou donkeys. We have a bunch of imports from France. You cannot register a donkey in France as a Poitou without an inspection. Okay, in the United States, we go more on pedigree lineage, you know, validation of pedigree. Is this a good horse or not? So that importance, I don't know. For me, the importance, what we're saying is, is it a purebred or not? Now, obviously, if, the, if you have purebred trash, that's not so hot because <laughs> then your demand structure is going to fall apart. Um, now, who gets to decide what trash is? That's really, really important because then all of a sudden, the people that decide what's good and what's bad, um, they're gatekeepers, you know, and, you know, I'll scratch your back, you scratch my back, then all of a sudden, the whole thing's become incredibly political. And actually, the, the, the objective quality of the horse becomes lost in this subjective, oh, I need to do my friend a favor. I really don't like this horse, but I love my friend. We're going to go ahead and you know, license this horse or accept this horse. And so those, those, are, the, those are the questions. Um, so you know, basically, for me, as a breed conservationist, I would go just based on lineage. I would not, at this you know, I, I'm answering the question, is this purebred or not? Not the question of how good a horse is it. You'll have to answer that question some other way. We can talk about that a little bit more. Another question, can the DNA test show if two horses are brothers or sisters? Because in Iran, we have this as an issue. The parents are lost or dead. And is it acceptable for the registry to keep the pedigree? Um, that's an important question. And um, the answer by and large is yes, but there are going to be exceptions. And so especially if the parents are lost, I think that you basically have to, um, if the parents are lost and the parents have not been DNA tested, um, this becomes a really, really tricky issue. 
and it's an important issue because um, if those horses are purebred and good, um, we want them, even if um, if there's a DNA loop there, especially in Iran, that may be missing. Um, another question, and I would I would be pronouncing names, but I would be mispronouncing names, so I'm probably not going to do that. Um, the Caspian is unusual and it has only been formalized as a breed since 1965. Well, this is a great question. It's, um, it's from Natasha Farouz, and we've actually corresponded some too. The basis of the breed was a phenotypical evaluation that was later validated by the assessment of offspring. Furthermore, the breed was established by very few breeders. It would seem important, almost indispensable, to include all possible phenotypical Caspians outside the home country's registry in the establishment and conservation of the breed. That is an excellent question and a wise, um, and a wise question because, and it, it's, that, it's that key um, issue, the Caspian has only been formalized as a breed since 1965. That's true. And this is, this is the big issue facing local breeds is that they predate And that is important because the breed does not date back from 1965. That formalization was only a recognition of a biological entity that existed long, long, long before then. And that is actually true of many, many breeds. And of course, here in the United States with our local breeds, many of those um, have histories of sometimes up to 400 years, and they've only been recognized in the last 30 years. Okay, well, that, that creates problems. So Florida cracker cattle, for example, and the DNA validates that these are actually a unique genetic resource that actually goes back 400 years, you know, but they're only formally recognized, oh my, since the late 1980s. So that's, I don't, I'm dating myself here, but you know, that's 30 years or less. So important point, yes. You know, and that goes back to the question of what is a breed? What is this breed? And how, do the, how, do the, how does the recognition of the breed interact with that biological entity, that biological truth? And that's what we're after. That's what we're trying to get back to. And so again, the challenge is different here than it is in Iran. And we should all be fascinated by what uh, the situation is in Iran, because that's gonna be basically the only source for the rest of us forever. So another chat, a worldwide registry is needed. I am not volunteering for that. Um, all countries being proactive about registering regardless of the local regions of the registry. How can we help other countries with this process as well as in the USA? That's a political question um, and an important one and it would be great. Reciprocity for these international breeds is extremely important. The breeder's name is prerequisite to the registered name is important as well, so that a farm is noted and recognized for their particular purebred program. And I really like that idea. You can do what you want. Um, I raise goats. Goats aren't worth much. That's okay. And goats, so everybody, goats have two purposes. One is to eat them, and the other one is to have a pet. Um, in my breed, more and more people have pet goats. So, of course, you have to name a pet. Most of my names are quite vulgar because it's a goat that's going through a fence and I have to catch it at the time. But um, the, the point here is all of my goats are named Beach Keld, which is our farm name, and then some number. So Beach Keld, you know, 2101 is the first goat born this year. The reason I do that is then my name, my program goes on that goat. So if you've got a really, really lousy goat and it's a Beach Keld goat, you're never coming back for another one. That makes me take care of my breeding program, not as well as I should, because I'm also interested in conservation, but, you know, I'm not going to sell a goat that I'm not going to be happy out there with the beach kelp name on it, with few exceptions. And so basically, this, this idea is a breeder's name is a um, prerequisite wise decision, because it always connects that horse back to that breeder. Those breeders need to be doing a good job and they need to be held accountable. This is one way to hold them accountable. Um, and then, uh, we've talked about the, the importance of um, recovering the purebreds, and we're gonna come back to that. Now, managing breed structures, we're gonna take a little diversion here. So um, managing breed structure is never easy. It's always important. Locating rare bloodlines is important. Using these effectively is important. We're going to um, 
come back in a minute. It's easy to swamp an entire breed with popular bloodlines, and it's almost um, impossible not to do that. Um, so we're going to. Um, this is a complicated issue because a lot of times the reason for a popularity is quality, and the reason for unpopularity is lousy quality. And so you know, I like to say that you know, some things, sometimes things are rare for a reason. <laughs> and that reason may be that they're unsound. That may reason be that you know, they have a temperamental problem or something like that. So there is, there is rare for a reason. We don't want just rarity on its own count. It needs to be uh, keyed in to quality of some level. Um, so, but it is easy to not pay attention to swamp an entire breed with popular bloodlines. And sometimes those popular bloodlines are only because they it's been able to have some sort of promotion or campaigning and events or something like that. And when I was working with the Chilean horses, um, they will everything is bred by artificial insemination. They can really swamp a breed really really quickly, and they love their one rodeo event, which is actually it's it's pretty good because it does select for trainability and longevity. I won't go into the details here, but you know if I had to pick one thing for a breed to do, it's this pinning steers up against a barrier. The youngest horse in competition is eight. Most of the horses are 10 to 15 years old. That, that's really, really good because you know you have a sound horse um, and a biddable horse. Um, but they have the same problem. You know, basically, if you, if you locate a decent horse that's been outside of this campaign structure, this promotion structure, it's just going to get totally lost. And so you're actually running the risk of losing bloodlines that are actually quite serviceable and quite rare just because they've been outside of this main thing. So you need to be sensitive to that. Um, and the rare bloodline horses, you, you have to locate them and you have to be reassured of reproduction so that the line is not lost. And this is much more than breeds this tail male and tail female almost becomes a religion and it, it's a really really poor religion because there is much much more to a horse than that portion of a pedigree that just goes back in the male line or back in the female line if you go back you know five six generations you know that's like three percent of the whole horse the rest of it came out of this whole middle and you, you're losing that um so take a few more chats here as a specialist and i may not be a specialist but is there any suggestion for DNA loop, which is a serious issue for purebreds in Iran. Many um, purebreds will lose three to four generations because of one loop. And I'm not, um, I don't, if somebody can explain that question to me, I don't understand the question. So either ask it again, I'm not trying to ignore it. I just don't understand it. Um, and does selection pressure vary in different countries and locations? Could this result in more breed standard diversity than is advisable? Um, so like high selection pressure for colors, things like that. Um, the breeders will have to answer that question. I don't know. Um, certainly across different, um, even breeding programs within a, within a single country, you can have a different emphasis. Um, if you're following fads, especially in color, and Louise and I actually had a really interesting discussion because she had located some buckskin horses and you know I love horse color. So I like to include that sort of thing. Um, in some countries, uh, color variation is, is shunned, um, very much so. And so actually, um, and I don't know how many um, British people we have here, but in a lot of British um, registries, they will not allow body spots. Um, and so this actually has caused the elimination of some really, really fascinating colors in some of these breeds, simply because they've imposed color selection against those colors in the United States. Um, selection for odd colors has led in the opposite direction. And we end up with you know, weird selection for odd colors in some breeds where those did not used to occur. So that either way, that can be actually bad. You can be eliminating things that are actually purebred, or you can be including things that perhaps really don't belong. Um, that, that's, an, that's a tricky issue. OK, now the rare bloodlines that makes a whole lot of sense if those horses are actually mated together to sort of preserve that rarity so that you can actually bring it out. Um, if you, if, 
if you avoid too much influence in these of into a rare bloodline with the common bloodlines, you're basically erasing it. And we see this with the marsh tacky horses. We've ended up with some, um, you know, 20 year old rare mares, 20 year old rare bloodline stallions. And that, that, that breed is actually a really, really good example because most, you know, 90% of the horses in that breed come out of one breeding program. And so the other 10% future and success of that breed. So what we do is we take those 20 year old stallions and 20 year old mares, made them together, and then we're able to get their genes in a younger horse that can be used more widely um, to help balance and manage the bloodlines. Um, so what you're trying to do here is to assure some genetic distance and variation on into the future. Um, and then Another question, one of the problems encountered in Iran is trying to register horses when a DNA analysis of the parents is not possible because they are no longer alive or cannot be located. Uh, that, that's an important question because I think it really comes back to this issue of what is the breed? Is the breed what is in the registry? Is what is recognized or is the breed um, something larger that can be outside of that? And in Iran, I think the answer you know, pretty much has to be yes, it can be outside of that. Um, now, that is not to say anything goes. You know, I think that there has to be a rigorous um, validation of the history of the horse, the, the type of the horse, and then I think that the DNA becomes secondary. You know, and most of this validation, especially for the local, local breeds in the local situation, it revolves around validating the, the history, the looks, and then the DNA. And when you can broadly and when you can sample broadly enough, um, the DNA is always going to validate the history and the appearance. And we, we've done this again and again and again um, in breeds, in local breeds in North America. And we, we basically just don't have surprises. Um, so, you know, basically, if the history, what I'm trying to say is in Iran, if the history is right, if the phenotype is right, then the DNA is going to be right by definition. And if, it, if it's something unusual, that means that the previous efforts simply overlooked something that was out there that they didn't catch at the time. And there's, there's going to be stuff out there that they did not catch. And I realize that's going to be controversial. This is just my look at it. Now back to, back to politics and culture, because that's where the real, that's where the, a lot of this is going to be. Work together. Quarter horse breeders figured this out in the 1950s. I can respect another breeder's horse and not breed to it. This was radical. In the 50s, there were something like 20 different quarter horse registries. Now you don't have to like quarter horses, um, but they have become, I, I, I actually think, it, it's certainly the most populous breed in North America. And it actually may be, as a purebred registered horse, the most populous horse breed internationally. You know, and you know, I am not a quarter horse breeder. I am not a quarter horse aficionado, okay? Doable. It means you have to swallow hard a lot. I have, now, I have yet to meet an animal breeder that did not think they were nearly always right and everybody else was wrong. And after last week, I can tell you, this happened to me way, way too many times. And so a certain amount of confidence is a good thing, um, but, as soon as it excludes others of goodwill, now that goodwill is important, this becomes a problem because some people are stingers, okay? And again, last week I worked with a whole bunch of them. They weren't Caspian horse breeders, so you're off the hook. Now, you know, you can pull something out today and I'll change my mind, but in general, you know, it, it, was, it was something else. Now, so a successful animal breeder believes in what they're doing and they're good at it. And that brings along the idea that, you know, well, everybody should be doing it as well as I can do it. And as soon as you go there, then you got problems. This, this, is, this is really, really interesting. And especially when you're talking about um, highly promoted breeds, this is a real problem. When you're talking about local breeds, this gets to be a huge problem because you're gonna come up with some old guy or old woman, either one, uh, some, somebody old that's been doing it forever, been successful, you know, and, you know, basically nobody else is as good as this as I am, and nobody else has pure animals like mine are, 
and that can really impede progress. Um, as soon as as soon as the old established people prevent the next generation from coming in and making a good contribution that's going to be different than the old timers, then you're stuck because breeds they they need the old people. That's where they got the breed. They need the young people because that's where the breed's going. And without both of those, yeah, it just doesn't work. Oh no. Okay. We ran out of slides. That doesn't mean we ran out of discussion. That means you have to chat. Now, um, one thing is, uh, one question that came up, let's see. I'm gonna stop sharing and then we can look at each other. Um, one, um, one, one issue is, what about, what are a breeder's responsibilities? Okay, and, and now I, I'm approaching this whole thing as a biologist and that does not always work. So I am, I am greatly in favor of recovering purebreds. There's two reasons for lapsed purebreds in places like the United States, okay? I'm not gonna talk about other places, but in the United States, there's two reasons for lapsed purebreds. One is an accident. You know, something happens, purebreds get lost, no problem. The other is, was basically criminal. You know, they, they weren't doing a good job and now they're trying to cover their tracks and get all their horses recovered after they have spent years and years and years not playing the game, not registering the horses, not being a system. That is irresponsible. It is going to be extremely difficult to make a recovery effort that does not um, reward bad action. And then you just have to figure out how important is the breed, how important is excluding these bad actors, these irresponsible breeders. I'm not, I'm not in favor of irresponsible breeders, but in the interest of breed conservation, there have been times when I've had to swallow really, really hard and say, well, okay, you're back in um, and you're, the, the animals are back in, even though that doesn't really, really feel good. So, um, yeah, <laughs> and this is this is you know this is one reason, especially especially when there's multiple breed associations and there's multiple camps that really really do not like one another. Um, this this becomes a problem. Um, okay, uh, th this is <laughs> I have a tricky question here. And um, Atesha may have to answer, and I hope I'm halfway pronouncing that correctly. Um, one registry in the United States emphasizes the distinction between Farouz Caspians and non Farouz Caspians. Based on your interactions with Louise Farouz, and those were very, very minimal, um, is that a concept that she would have endorsed? Um, again, I had very, very limited. Um, she was really, really interested in the breed. Um, and so my impression is that that she would find that distinction to be trivial. That you know, she, was, she was very, very diligent. She was very, very good with the horses. I think that she would be fully accepting of good horses that did not go through her hands. Um, and I'm speaking for her and that may be out of line, but she was wise and she was very, very constructive. Um, with the rare breed, with the exception of a, with the exception of rare bloodline inbreeding, is it vital to recognize the fact that phenotype is just as important as genotype, breeding the best of the best as much as possible to maintain conformational excellence? How can we make this a forefront priority? And yes, with a rare breed, you have to pay attention to type. Just because something's rare, okay, say I have a rare horse and it's got sickle hawks or something like that, okay, so it's got some conformational that you don't like. Now, okay, um, I gotta be careful here. Say you got a rare horse with some major conformational flaw. Now, each one of us is gonna think major conformational flaw and you're thinking something different. Okay, I got that. No, but it's got really, really rare genetics. I may have to use that horse, but I have to be extremely careful of what I'm using that horse with. Now, say I've got a horse, and this happens, um, Akulteki breeders in the United States um, have a genetic defect. Um, 
we're in the breed. It's not all the horses in the breed, um, but then they're wondering how to manage that defect. Should we be breeding horses with that that are carrying that genetic defect? Well, if if we breed that horse to a horse that does not carry that defect, then we can eliminate that defect and not eliminate everything that that carrier horse has to offer. So that that's fairly that's important. We can do that. You know, so you know, basically the issue is what's the defect? How important is it? You don't want to be breeding trash to trash. You know, anytime that you have a any time that you have a horse with a weakness, you want to be breeding to, to a horse with a strength in that same area. Um, I, I imported Bulgarian livestock guard dogs. And so, you know, yes, some of the dogs have weaknesses, but by breeding those weaknesses to strength, we've been able to produce strength and not lose the good the good aspects of that specific dog. I mean, a trivial example, but there you go. Um, you know, so yeah, you want to breed the best of the best, but you do not want to ignore everything else. And the thing is, yeah, best of best is going to give you something good. That's great. The question is, what do you do with the ones that aren't the best? If you throw them all out and uh, think about Holstein cattle. Holstein cattle, there are millions of Holstein cattle in the world. They always breed the best of the best. As far as genetically unique individuals, you know, that you could make out of that whole gene pool, it's like 29. I mean, this is a disaster. And they got there by breeding best to best, best to best, best to best. So the question is, what do you do with the not the not the best? So what you want to do with the not the best is to make sure that you're breeding them to improve them, but not to eliminate them. But the next generation had better be better and not worse. And so that's what you're trying to do. Every generation better, every generation better. And sometimes that means, yeah, we're going to eliminate this one. But more often it means, no, we're going to breed this one wisely to make sure that the next step is better. Uh, can I recount the importance of the Caspian genetic pool to horse breeds today? I, why are we safeguarding this breed's genetics? Um, OK, because it's important. <laughs> um, in, within um, any species, the breeds that are most extreme are going to house genetic variation that is the most important. I um, So um, Brian Larson said, yes, I have these Brahma chickens, and all I do is breed funky, uh, interesting colors of Brahma chickens, you know. And so it's not breed conservation. I will dream. They're huge, they're big, they're gentle, and they have feathery feet. When you do the DNA analysis of chicken breeds, the Brahma pops out first as unique and it stays there. Okay, and, and you know the, the, the lesson here is that all you have to do is look at a Brahma chicken and you already knew that because they're so different than any other chicken on the planet. Okay, now so you know a lot of you are you know little black boxes, so I can't see your faces, but you know, do you think that a Caspian horse can be easily confused with another breed or is, does it have phenotypic uniqueness? I think they're fairly unique. I mean, they, they got this size, they got this look that, you know, really very, very few other horses have. And so, um, if any, and so, yes, they're unique. And what that means is, yes, this, I mean, I, um, a lot of these headaches that I've expressed were in fact, with horse breed conservation. Okay, so you know, you know, colonial Spanish horses in North America, 23 different breed associations. I don't need that in my life. Um, and I, I find these horses to be quite interesting and quite useful. So, but most horse breeds in the, in the world could be reconstructed fairly easily. There's a few exceptions. The Caspian is one of those exceptions. The Icelandic horse is one of those exceptions. The Brabant or the Arden horse is another exception. You know, yes, actually, we could reconstruct a thoroughbred. We probably can't reconstruct a Turkoman horse, you know, or an Aquatagi. We can't reconstruct those. Those are important. Um, whether you could reconstruct an Arabian horse or not, I don't know. You probably, and, you know, some of these old Spanish lines, you couldn't reconstruct it. So, warm bloods, yeah, we could reconstruct that in a heartbeat. Um, so, but you cannot reconstruct a Caspian. If they are lost, they are gone for good. We cannot reconstruct that. And so, I, you know, for horse breeds with high priority, I have a very, very, very short list, and the Caspian is on that list. I don't know if that helps you or not. <clears throat> My list may not help anybody. 
Um, okay, would inspections help create grand individual horses as well as preserve DNA? Thanks. Um, inspections, inspections are really, really interesting and it just, it depends on how you do it. Um, inspections have to be done extremely wisely. Um, and the reason I say that is um, if, if you could, in, in many European countries, they do have inspections. And if you look at the, um, if you look at the fate of the Hofflinger horse, it's sort of interesting. The Hofflinger horse for many, many, many decades was a riding horse, which surprised me. And then they decided that now what we actually need is a draft horse, um, a small in an Austrian situation, this actually worked out quite well. Um, so the, then the inspectors started passing and you know letting breed stallions that were heavier than the old traditional type. Now they decided, well, you know, actually the future of this horse is a riding horse. So now they're going back to the original type. So that they, they switched the type. The importance being inspections can change type. And so it, it depends on who's doing the inspections. And most of the people doing the inspections have a vested interest in a certain type of horse. In warm blood breeding, um, most of the warm bloods had a fairly heavy original type that was useful for farmers because that was the use of the horse. And warm blood breeding is fascinating to me because that type still exists. And still within most breeds, within most warm blood breeds, you can find that type and you can breed to it. And a lot of the old conservative breeders do that. And so you, know, you can actually find you know, Oldenburg horses that are all Oldenburg, very, very few, because the inspection has gone more towards a sport horse type for dressage and for stadium jumping and things like that. That sport horse type is really, really interesting. And I, um, I have no idea, but that sport horse type usually came from breeding thoroughbred stallions back to these heavy mares. And it, my opinion is that that type may actually be a hybrid type. And so you do not want to lose those heavy mares and the inspection system needs to be making sure that you have stallions that can do that. So um, yes, I, I, I am not opposed to inspections, but they have to be done wisely. I mean, in the case of the Norco horse in Austria, the, the inspections actually do a great job of maintaining a very, very useful type, or at least did for decades. But for many, many horses, they changed the type and they changed it dramatically. So inspections, you know, I'm not opposed to this old um, cantankerous breeder out there doing what they're going to do because they've always done it and they've always liked it. And, you know, whether anybody else likes it or not. Um, some of those people actually end up having the resource that we need in the future. Um, by, by going against what was at the time um, the prevailing trend. Whether that's important for this breed, I don't know. Some people think that everyone should have access to the DNA markers used for Caspian parentage validation. Others think the DNA results should remain with the testing lab to safeguard the breed. The downside of making the DNA marker available is that it has allowed some people to do their own thing to the detriment of the breed as a whole. Is there a best practice to follow? Um, and I, I'm not sure one way or the other. Um, I, um, my general philosophy, and again, we can we can differ. The more information out there, the uh, the better. And so, in my in my goat breed, the um, the pedigree database is searchable and it's online, and anybody can go and find anything they want. Um, DNA databases, I'm a little bit less sure of. But um, I'm, especially for pedigree databases, I, I see a whole lot of good reasons for making them widely available. Um, I'm involved in other breeds where they very, very closely guard everything. And it's almost a trade secret um, that can work. Uh, and I don't know, I, I'm not aware of the abuses. And depending on the abuses, I might argue that yes, you should safeguard it, but I'm not aware of the abuses. In the UK, inspection is only for stallion licensing and is done by an independent vet. In my opinion, the quality of the male herd is better than the female herd generally. And <clears throat> yes, in general, the quality of the male herd should be better because there is such a thing as geldings. Um, and um, 
yes, if if the stallion licensing, and again, it depends on it depends on the goals. You know, if if, if it's soundness and fertility, that's great. Um, I could always argue that for conservation, um, sometimes there is a place for limited use of a substandard stallion. Um, and if the and if the um, inspection is eliminating that option, that can actually be to the detriment of the long term future of the breed. Um, I emphasized um, the significance of history and the look of the horse in comparison to the emphasis on DNA, parent verification are only. Could I please elaborate the details of this kind of historical information, which registries better gather and archive that were useful with conservation identification of other breeds you have worked with? Maybe details of identification, breeding records, falling death. <laughs> okay, you're vastly overestimating the, <laughs> the breeds I'm working with here. Um, I work, okay, I work with Choctaw horses. Choctaw horses were raised for years and years and years on the open range in Southeast Oklahoma. What that means is there are no pedigrees and there are no details. <laughs> the identification is by fire branding. <laughs> Um, and that's not all the horses because you got to catch the horse first. Um, so, uh, but those horses that come out of this area that these people knew, that's the history. And they have this appearance, so that's the phenotype. Um, now this, this is going to look, so that's for Choctaw horses in Oklahoma. And it turns out when you crossbreed a Choctaw horse, you don't get the Choctaw type back again. So just that type doesn't really respond well to crossbreeding. So that, that helps you there. Um, <clears throat> but that would be the, um, the history. And the, the, you know, going to be the ones that know the sorts of histories they come up with when they come across a horse that's been overlooked. You know, and that's going to vary place to place. Um, so you know, back to the American situation, again, th these are Spanish horses, because that's mostly what I interact with. Um, there's a, well, this, this history may be too long and complicated, it may not make sense to non-Americans, but the, the native populations in the, in the Southeast were removed to Oklahoma in the 1830s. They brought their horses with them. That doesn't mean all the horses were left, that were left out of Alabama and Mississippi. There is a fort in, in, I think it's Western Mississippi, Eastern Louisiana, that has a bunch of you know, unowned feral horses. This is um, Fort Polk. You look at those horses and they look Spanish. Isolated because Fort Polk isolated the horses. So you look at the horses, they look Spanish. <clears throat> They're isolated, you know that. And then you do the DNA and of all the horse population in North America, they are the ones that look by DNA most close to the horses on the Caribbean islands, Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, Cuba. And those are where those horses first landed in the new world. And so, yeah, you know, basically because of the history, because of the looks, we've been able to validate something that's actually, you know, a fairly high conservation priority. So, you know, that ain't gonna work with Caspian horses in North America. We're not gonna go out and find you know, somebody in some small town in Missouri that all of a sudden had a bunch of Caspian horses that we didn't know about. That's not going to happen. That's going to happen in Iran. And that story is going to be an Iranian story. And then it's going to have to make sense in an Iranian context, because it's not, you know, what, what we're doing here makes sense in an American context because of our history, because of the way this works. Yes, we can make sense of that. But we, we can't impose that on the Iranian situation. It's going to be an Iranian story that makes sense to the Iranians. And then that's going to validate those horses as part of this breed that may have been overlooked. Uh, let's see. Um, is, is history, pedigree, and phenotypic evaluation something that should be considered as the information to be archived in the central database? I already told you, I just love information. And so, yes, you know, write down the stories, you know, catalog that. If nothing else, the stories, um, these, um, another reason for preserving these breeds are who we are, you know, and so especially for the Iranians, part of the Caspian story is who they are. And so, you know, I was asked this in Slovenia, I said, well, why should we save these goats? And the story on the goats was fascinating. We don't have time for it, but it's like, don't lose the goats. These goats are who you are. This is your history. This is who you are. You know, and so um, the Caspian horse is a living record of centuries, millennia of somebody 
you lose the horse, you lose that whole cultural background. We can't lose that. Anytime you can capture that, you need to capture that. It's absolutely essential. Um, when I say DNA database, are you referring to parentage testing? Uh, yes, as far as I know, that would be the only DNA database that you would have is the parentage testing. Um, okay, and Atesha, can you unmute yourself and weigh in on the Farouz horse versus the non Farouz horse question? Because I, I would value that. Um, that's going to be quite valuable. Um, sure, I can do that. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Um, I think my mother would take issue with that. I think she was very concerned that the genetic de uh, basis of the breed be expanded. And um, we can even go back into the archives and find letters that she's written to people where she's explained why at certain times she may have closed the stud book that she was keeping to entries of horses that she considered phenotypically non-Caspian but the, in general, she was very open to a much broader genetic base. And I think if you look at the types of horses that appear in the various breed shows and the various sort of census that we've taken in Iran in the past that three years, the quality of unregistered horses is absolutely phenomenal. So there are a lot of um, Caspians in the, in the mountains and in the shores of the Caspian Sea that haven't been registered, that haven't been census, but that are phenotypically at least purebred, for me, purebred Caspian. Of course, there are rules and reg regulations uh, for such animals. So it takes a number of years before we can actually register them as purebred Caspians, but they are out there and they should be considered and they should be uh, part, of, part of the a Caspian registry if they indeed produce offspring that are phenotypically Caspian. And that's what my mother believed. And you can, uh, I repeat what I uh, have heard her say, but it's also documented in letters she's exchanged with a lot of the UK breeders with whom she worked extensively. That is really helpful. And I, um, I can, I, I have such a letter. Um, I have correspondence, you know, indicating that yes. Um, yeah, I believe she also corresponded uh, regularly with you on the subject. And um, it would really be helpful if you do have these letters to be, uh, the Cornell University is, is housing her archives. And if you have these letters, it, it would be really nice if you could send a dig digital copy to the Louis Fears archives at Cornell University, because that is, as you say, the culture of not only the breed, but also Iran. I can do that. Thank you. Perhaps we've reached a, uh, a good point in our uh, uh, webinar today. Um, are there any other burning questions that need to be answered or should we thank Phil for his excellent presentation? And uh, there's a lot to think about. So uh, thank you, Phil. I appreciate your, your wisdom and your uh, tenacity of keeping us on track. Well, thank you all and keep, keep doing this important work. So we're gonna uh, just, uh, we'll keep the 